Good morning, everyone out there in Twitch land. Welcome to twitch.tv slash dnd. Is it morning? It feels like morning. I feel like I've, it's like 8 o'clock in the morning, but it's not. It's about noon because that is when this show happens. You have reached Dungeon Master's Guide here on twitch.tv slash dnd. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, and we were supposed to have our very first episode with, imagine if you will, the amazing water deep backdrop. Um, yeah, but we don't have all of our sets in. It takes a little bit longer to do things. And I do believe half of our uh, production team is out sick. So just like a true dungeon master, we are dungeon mastering this whole thing. And we're going to bring you a QA. and a I will let you know who the guests are after I go back and re revisit something that we missed last episode. There was a really funny little thing that happened. It wasn't really funny because it was the sound went out right when I was introducing the new correspondence for this show for the future. So I'm going to do that right now. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Uh, we have Lauren Urban, Lisa Chen, Alan Patrick. Uh, Lauren Urban is the community manager for D&D Beyond. If you haven't gone there yet, go to dndbeyond.com. It is pretty fantastic and what a lot of us use now for characters and campaign building. Um, we have Lisa Chen, who's a dungeon master for DMs Guild. Check that out, dmsguild.com. You can make adventures and share it and sell it and then get feedback from people in the community. It's really good for, I really enjoy it for that. Not only do you have PDFs of all the things, but you get to get feedback, which is important. No one's an island. I'm gonna get a shirt that says that, no one's an island. Alan Patrick is the community manager for um, Adventures League. Organized play, if you don't know about it, go find out about it, adventuresleague.com, I do believe. Next up we have, um, so those are, you know, uh, those are kind of obvious other community managers involved with Dungeons and Dragons, but we're taking it outside of the box. We also have uh, JNB from Cognitive Merchant in Manchester as our European correspondents out in the field. Manchester has an incredible, incredible D&D community. I mean, we were walking around and there's boom, beholder graffitied on the wall. So that's pretty awesome. We also have Fenway Jones, 15 year old dungeon master, and she actually created Jasper's Game Day. And that is a charity event. I do believe they're just raising money all over the place at conventions, at different game stores. Uh, but the big event is next year. Check out Jasper's Game Day online. I do believe, I don't know exactly the address. I'm a jerk face, but you have Google, you have whatever you search on, go do that. Check it out. Um, also, don't forget, please send us your one minute DM tips, or not DM tips, that's a, a different thing. One minute maximum. House rules, Dungeon Master House rules. You have one minute. If it goes over one minute, we're not gonna show it, but that's how you can participate in this show. You send us your video, one minute max, to dndfanart at wizards.com. So those are the things. Now we're going to get to these very amazingly patient people who are sitting right next to me. Some of my favorite people on the planet, Kelly Lynn D'Angelo and Rudy Rutenberg. Thank you guys for coming. Yay! Insert applause button. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for being here on such short notice, <laughs> like true dungeon masters. Yeah. That is how we roll. I mean, you were going to be here anyway. Yes. Well, but thanks for having me, having me anyway. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to be here. Yay. Hey. Um, why don't you tell everyone, both of you, who you are, exactly what you do in the real world and how they might know you. All right. Should I start? I, do I look here? Do I look here? I want to look here. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's in my general direction. I should look in this direction. Hello. Hi. <laughs> yep. I'm Kelly Lynn D'Angelo. Hi. Um, I am the Dungeon Master for Girls Gets Glory, which is going to be on after this episode, so stay tuned. Um, I also play on Sirens of the Realm with Satine, which has been awesome. I've GM'd a couple games uh, over at Geek and Sundry, which I've been involved with uh, for the last couple years, and actually... I write musicals and television and film. That's kind of my bread and butter, uh, which I do out here in LA. I've written for like a couple of television shows, My Little Pony, a Little Pet Shop, and then got off season two of Final Space this year. So I do a lot, <laughs> but I'm really happy to be here because the DMing is my soul. So You have a musical out right now? Oh, yes. And That's I have a, a musical. Deal. Yes, I have a musical called Starry. I've written a couple of musicals, but... 
we've been running this one since summer and it's about once a month and we have two more shows left coming up uh, called Starry, which is about Vincent and Theo Van Gogh out here in Los Angeles. So if you're in town, I would absolutely love to share that with you because it's the the distilled essence of everything I am, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially. So my soul's out there on the canvas. You get to make, tear it apart. You get to be the critic. That sounds like fun, right? No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> And I'm Rudy Rutenberg. You can find me on all the social thingies at Rudy Woot. You can also uh, find me and Satine at Maze Arcana, which we are the co-creators for. Uh, we put on a lot of productions, uh, even as a production company, if it is not our show that is under the Maze Arcana banner. Uh, beyond that, I am also a film and television writer uh, and... I am an RPG game designer. You are. Yeah. So uh, you were talking about Lisa earlier uh, being the community manager of the Absolutely. DMs Guild, where we were able to debut the Eberron supplement, Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron. And I am the co-author of that along with Keith Baker. And we are also going to be putting out a follow-up to that very soon called Morgraves Miscellany, ah. which will essentially give you the uh, university guide to different subclasses oh, cool. of Eberron, as well as some of the new updated things that you need to know uh, to really make Eberron a very immersive place for not only your players, but for your imagination to kind of grow and expand and to play Dungeons and Dragons in a little bit different light than you might be used to. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for being a part of one of my, of bringing back one of my favorite settings. I mean, you, you were actually who introduced me to Eberron and to Keith, and I fell in love with it instantly. And I started basically designing stuff for you for our game for 5th edition. It's true. And that's how that, like, that is really where the beginning of my design started. So for everybody that thinks that, like, you can't, yo, know, I need all this background and experience and all that other stuff, I've only been doing game design for about two years, and I've gotten to this place. And it's, but Satine can also tell you that I've spent a he lot of, sleep. yeah, I've spent <laughs> a lot of, like, four to six uh, a.m. <laughs> nights, which when writing film and television, you only have to do when your, your show is in crunch. Yeah. You know? But for the most part, that's that's probably been what, uh, obviously, having a live stream didn't hurt with the awareness of like, oh, this kid can design stuff. But yeah. Oh, man, Rudy, that is a great segue. What we're here to talk about today is dungeon mastering, hence the Dungeon Master's Guide title. But it's about dungeon mastering, comparing live stream dungeon mastering to home game dungeon mastering. Uh, before we even get into the rest of the year of conversations, it's really important that you guys know that what we do isn't just, it's not the same. It's different. And we have reasons why it's different. Um, you can't compare yourself to what you see on TV because there's a, so much prep and so many reasons for all the things. So you guys, um, what is your background on dungeon mastering before you started uh, streaming? Well, it's funny because I, I was always a player. For a long time, I was a player. Uh, and then finally, about four years ago, um, I finally, there was a, a discussion happening. Suddenly, D&D &D was coming kind of back on Vogue. And uh, I just, we couldn't find a DM. So I just started to pick up the book. I read through it like, 18 times, maybe. <laughs> um, I actually created uh, index cards with all the spells on them to try to memorize them. Mm. And like I was like... flashcards? Yeah, like flashcards. Like, this is what a DM does, right? Like, you have to, like, know everything in the book. I've so, seen Satine um, actually do the flashcard thing as well, though, <laughs> with spells. For other things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, I mean, this is what I, I initially thought it was. So I did that. I just DM'd at home games for about two years until it suddenly became a professional opportunity, uh, maybe two and a half. And that was, that was pretty awesome. So that's kind of my background with DMing, just some small home games uh, with a lot of new players. You had a lot of people at your game, so, because that's actually how I heard of you. Because everyone yeah. was like, oh my God, our Dungeon Master is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, the first game I played. I did, again, I 
was really nervous about DMing the first time. And it was just at this rinky dink apartment I had. And I had 13 people huh. in my first huh. game who were all new to DM, uh, D&D, except for maybe one person. And maybe two. And so we're all just sitting around with 13 people. I'm like, this this is what a dungeon master does, right? You can invite in as many people as you want. So I slowly started to learn the tricks and the trades of DMing. Um, and also I think that I invited a bunch of people in because I wanted to uh, eventually learn about all these different people who had different classes. And I thought it would be like almost um, grinding myself, like taking an advanced course in high school, but I learned quickly, like it was more a crash course <laughs> than yeah. an advanced course. Um, but yeah, and then I ran that game that started from there for about a year and a half, two years, and then eventually had to move on to some other things, but they're still playing to this day, those people I initially played with. Um, it's a good good group of humans. Nice. So. Cool, and then my DMing experience started with uh, we, the group that we had kind of in fourth edition, or sorry, in fifth edition, that group uh, was, uh, they got the play test for D&D Next when uh, they were kind of in between Transformer movies and the X-Men movies. So mm -hmm. they, uh, they needed extra people. I came in, I started playing with them. And then when we had to go off because they had to go do production stuff, I had to do production stuff on some other stuff, I kind of like lost it for a little bit and but still had the the itch and ended up going on a meetup which ended up being the meetup that Satine initially already had unbeknownst to me because I didn't oh. know who she was uh, and then I had already started to uh, through that meetup I started to meet some of the other people in the community who introduced me into Adventures League which I didn't know about previously in any of my experience and from there Adventures League always needs DMs. We, we always need more people to come in and run games. So if you want to run and you're afraid you can't fill out a table, don't worry about it. We will give you a table of players. <laughs> so I started there almost by accident because I was at a convention I was playing and they had a DM that just couldn't show up. And they I'd already been playtesting some of the new modules with them uh, not that same group, but like with the Adventures League group that I'd made friends with, I got to play test some of those modules because some of them were actually getting to write some. And they knew me well enough to go, hey, we trust you enough with a table. Would you please run something? Like, would you please run this? And I'm like, oh, I guess. What slot do you need me to run it in? Um, the one in 10 minutes. Oh, sure. I guess so. <laughs> Stuff of nightmares. <laughs> so I, you know, I was like, well, I know the game really well. I know all the, I know the ins and outs of the PHB, dungeon mastering. I've seen enough different play, uh, dungeon masters. I think I can wing this. And essentially I did. Uh, it went pretty well. And then from there, uh, I just started thinking about craft and, and writing and how similar those two storytelling mechanisms can be, but also... Uh, as a writer, one of the things that we enjoy most is the problem solving of how does this affect this down the road. And one thing that is uh, almost parallel from design work is that you have to look at design and storytelling as, it's, as if it's a carpet. And so when you move something, it can bunch up in other places and become uh, just an eyesore uh, or just not work entirely. Cause people to trip, fall, bust their face open, stuff like that. So. What we wanted to, what I, what I wanted to learn out of that was how to start making it feel seamless, and especially for Adventures League, how to make it feel as though you're not being railroaded. It's and a good metaphor, by the way, thank the, you. The, the carpet thing. Also, That's we've, good. we've been doing a lot of online shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did to look for a carpet. So when we're doing, so so then that kind of got me into the mode of doing it, and I eventually, and by eventually I mean like probably the next con or the one after that. Were, was running four slots a day over four day weekends. So I was running anywhere between 12 and 16 games over a weekend, yeah. uh, which was hardcore. And there are some DMs that are out there that still are doing that hardcore. Raise my glass to you, my yeah. friends. Yeah. For, you and, and for nothing but the love yeah. of Yeah, street respect. So uh, that love was the my... community, and that's what it is. Right. It's about them appreciating everyone else that's coming in wanting to make sure that that nobody's let down. It's right. out of like the best part of a person's heart. It's, yeah, 
And our community is awesome. We are very fortunate that this is one of the strongest RPG and gaming communities that is accepting and welcoming of the people that we've we've been fortunate enough to kind of um, find this this unity with, this enjoyment. Yeah. And stand. So that's how I started DMing, and then uh, at some point, uh, 2016, June 2016, I uh, met Satine at the release for a for the Storm King's Thunder and Force Grey Season 2, I think. And uh, we were sitting down at a table with our friend Chris Lindsay, who is not our friend yet, uh, and we kind of like instantly clicked in our role-playing, and then she and I were, went on hikes and talked about things uh, Dungeons and Dragons related, and then essentially was like, hey, do you want to do this thing? Yeah, sure, let's do that. Okay, do you want to DM? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and then that's how Maze Arcana essentially got started. Yeah, that is how it got started. Like, hey, and that was like six days after we met. Do you, would you like to do all the things? <laughs> yeah, essentially. I mean, we even created a Slack that was do all the, do like, doing, doing all the do things all or that. something like that. So, okay, let's talk about the kind of when you both transferred over, you were invited into a new group that had already been started. Yeah. Um, you have, we built that one from scratch mm -hmm. for the show. What was that like? Um, okay, so there's a, those are two totally different things. What is it like jumping in on someone else's game on stream with their own expectations? What is it like building from scratch, not knowing if everyone's going to get along? Like, those are two really important things especially on stream, which is harder than at a home campaign where you're just like, okay, guys, it's not working versus, oh God, it has to work. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I am in many ways a, a perfectionist. Um, I, I was really nervous. I mean, like really, really nervous. I'm not going to lie. Like I had been running games at tables with people who started at first level who, you know, we were building up the levels together and the story together. Um, I was... Actually, I at that time, I was already playing my weekly Wednesday game that I still play. I was playing pickup games every other Sunday. Like, I was playing four to five campaigns a month. And then suddenly I got invited to this amazing group of women who had this amazing opportunity who, who needed a dungeon master. And I was like, oh, well, yes. Like, first of all, an all-women's game, that sounds incredible. Never done that before. Uh, but then second, like, secondly, like these are all people who are actors too. So like how exciting would that be as a television writer to sit at a table full of people who are actors, very talented actors and be able to play in that world with them. So I was beyond honored first that they even considered me and then too honored that they accepted me into the family because they're just like the nicest, sweetest group of people I think I've ever met. Um, <laughs> truly like now, literally, I'm living with one so of they them. They actually are the <laughs> most amazing, sweet, they're, genuine people. <laughs> they're, they're great. And they're fantastic players, too. But I, while I was trying to figure out what that was like, it was hard for me because I, I was coming in definitely with a lot of personal um, fears and anxieties. I was like, I only DM'd for two years. Like, am I even good at this? Like, I, I get that people, like you know, enjoy the games, but I look at someone like Matt Mercer and I'm like, I'm no Matt Mercer. Like I, he's amazing. Like, how do I become like him? And it's, it was one of those things where like I, and I was listening to the Avenger zone at the time and like all these amazing DMS. And I just, it, it, the world was starting to craft itself and I didn't see myself anywhere near as good as anybody else. So I was trying to get over that. Like, wait, I'm going to be on a stream but those people are on a stream or on a podcast. Like, I, how do I feel? How do I work through whatever this is? And I had to actually just keep the thing that really helped me with drive that home and get, a, get over that fear was the fact that I have been writing my whole life. And storytelling and narrative storytelling is something inherently within me. So I just had to kind of lean on lean on the things that made me who I was and say, okay, I'm going to put faith that these people have faith in me, even if I haven't been playing with them as long as they've been playing, even if they there's expectations or needs or wants or desires, I'm a perfectionist. It's really just about being authentically yourself. <laughs> so I just had to like reaffirm that to myself for like three months while I, the anxiety was, you know. As all the girls are building. staring at you going, we're yes. ready. 
okay. <laughs> We're, we bonded. Are you cool? Are you <laughs> and, and Kim was such a fantastic DM because she was so, um, she was just so into her character play and so into her, her world building too that I just wanted to, I wanted to be myself, but then also pay a, like homage to everything she created. So I'm hope I'm hopefully doing a version of that. So there's um, a bit of pressure on your side jumping into a group, but they were very welcoming. Yes, it sounds like exactly. I mean, it was. I think that in any situation where a new DMs needed or or anyone needs to come into a fam, like a familial like situation like that, as long as you are surrounded by good people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're joining a game that's ten years old. It doesn't matter if you're joining. A brand new game. I, in my personal opinion, it, it it's really it really boils down to we just want to have a good time. We want to have fun. So it comes down to being that. considerate. Yeah. Because considerate, if they're good people, totally. they can be considerate to the fact that you are new. That you need to become acclimated to what is is going on, and that they also need to acclimate to you. Because one of the things that Satine and I preach is that mm-hmm. not every table is for every player. Yeah. Or every DM. And that. DM styles are very much a reflection of your personality. Satine and I have drastically different styles if it is like our choice of what clown. we're gonna play. Yeah. But we can co-DM. And not many, not many duos can do that. Because uh, when you like I know Satine well enough to know when she needs to have the wings to open up and to and to, to do that, and I can kind of pull back a little bit, and then she knows that if there's something that needs to make a turn or something like that, she can basically just trust that I'm going to be right there because I've been listening to her the whole time Mm -hmm. and I know the worlds and the games and everything like that. So uh, the worlds and the rules. So that if she needs me, I'm there. And our, like, Fury's Reach, we co-wrote that entire thing and every week had to change the story to to work for two different groups. (laughs) Uh, and that's that shows you that like there is a style, and she maintained her style during it, and I maintained my style during it, and we came together for the launch of Fury's Reach and ran a game in front of everybody in a ninety-minute block with Oof. a ton of players. Like, what did we have? Nine players. Yeah, that's when we. I think we all really met for the first. Well, the we met game. Kelly at Geek and Sundry oh, yeah. at one point before she had uh, it's been started. Many years yeah. ago, mm-hmm. during one of those dance nights where we were playing <laughs> oh, yeah. on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Gather your party. So, yeah. to me, like, what we really have to be mindful of is that our future, like, where we're going and what, where we're going to be, is, is it has to be open. We have to be open to it. Like, Satine, would you have ever thought two years ago when you met me? that you would be the community manager for Dungeons and Dragons because of Maze Arch- because of what we built. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and, and it's that kind of a thing. I never would have thought that I actually would get to write Eberron with Keith. It's just one of those things where we have the... Uh, the world is going to kind of shift and change, and we need to be ready <clears throat> to change with it, just like when our players shift and change. We need to be ready to, to shift and change with yeah. them. And if we are courteous... We are keeping in mind the goals that they have for their characters and what they want out of a story, just like they're being courteous about the story that you're trying to facilitate. Yeah. Not your story you're trying to tell, because it's not your story. You are one fifth or sixth or eighth or whatever, one fourteenth of whatever kind of story that it, or whatever amount of people that are there. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back. Um, you jumped into a group and you created a group. We. We. Well, this is all, this is. This is about you today. Yeah, but I, I would be remiss if I were to say that okay. I did any of this. All right, as a dungeon master, mm-hmm. there is a crafting that has to happen. And in Orphan Echo, I'm a player, man, you know? Mm. So why don't you talk about what it was like for you to get a bunch of people who some you've played with, some you haven't played with. What was it like? Um, what were the challenges of doing that for stream versus hopping into a normal game? Well, things that we, you know, that you don't know uh, are things that you, again, have to be able to roll with and learn as you're going and and be thoughtful about. Because one thing that all humans are, to a degree, is resistant to change. And we want to be creatures of habit. We want to do things the way we want to do them and the way we think we ought to do them. And sometimes we don't consider how other people, uh, that other people are the same as us in that way. 
and that we need to make sure that if we want to play something that is cooperative, we have to be cooperative. We have to try and help. And so for our Orphan Echo game, one of the things that we had to uh, learn along the way was that we need to be communicative with people, not just while we're at the table, but around it. We need to be able to set expectations because you can't, you can't be disappointed in somebody if you haven't set their expectation uh, appropriately uh, or if you haven't helped them to set a healthy expectation. So coming together, learning new people that I haven't played with and then how they're going to gel with people that, that I have played with, that was all, and then making sure that the tone of the game that we were trying to play matched the world and the setting and stuff right. like that, and that that was accurately communicated to other people. So, while at the same time letting them know that they are part of the storytelling thing. There was a lot, a lot of time in our initial early things where uh, Satine would be like, well, you're telling the story, and I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. That's the, You have to appreciate uh, that your players are part of that storytelling process and, and the moment we get at this in writing a lot in Hollywood especially but the moment an idea leaves your mouth it is no longer your idea it is number one been put out in the zeitgeist of the inner of the universe so it's going to happen sooner <laughs> or later and it may not be with you if you let it go <laughs> yeah but once you set that stage that's that's your input on the story now players are going to start putting their input in there and how that world reacts to them is going to inform their decisions and the consequences that come from those decisions. You can't be mad at somebody for treating the world as if it is inconsequential if you don't give them the expectation that they're, the things they're doing matter. Yeah. So for those of you who are just jumping in and who are like, what is this? This isn't a game. It's not. It's a Dungeon Master's Guide. And we're talking today about... Um, Dungeon mastering on screen versus dungeon mastering at a home campaign. So why don't we talk a little bit about, oh, before that, there is a raffle, exclamation mark raffle in the chat. Lauren, um, yeah, put exclamation mark in the chat when Lauren opens up the raffle and you could win a beautiful, brand new, shiny, smells like new, not new paper, Dungeon Master's Guide. Woo! Um, yeah, so do that in the thing. And if you have any questions on dungeon mastering for screen, we're going to take three of them. Lauren is in chat and is going to is organizing that. That's why I keep looking at my phone because because information lives here. So um, why don't we go ahead and talk about how do you prep? What, what are the difference in prepping? We only have a half hour left. What's the difference in prepping for screen versus prepping for um, for your home game? Shall I start on this one? Yeah. yeah, you take the lead on that one. Okay. So in your prep for home, I think the big, big difference is between being on stream and being at home. One, time limits, right? So you have, you have a clock that you have to be mindful of uh, for your stream. There maybe are people that are willing to sit and watch you kind of fumble through things for eight hours. There are, but unlikely, uh, but there are players that will certainly sit there and fumble through it with you for eight hours. You can have all day game a and whatnot. But is that necessarily entertaining? So one of the things, again, as a writer, uh, that we learn is that you really only want to share the things that are most pertinent to things that are going on, either whether that's character building or story building. And in streaming, you have to be able to keep those, those margins pretty tight and know when to move on from something. Uh, we had an incident in Inkwell Society uh, in the premiere this last Sunday, or sorry, last Wednesday, where uh, you got hammered on uh, this gold bottle of, of so sauce. That's so wasted. <laughs> I feel like that's not it. <laughs> like you just, yeah. That's so drunk. You're drunk. Oh, bro. drink too much. So, I was so sad. Yeah, you were super sad. And it, so, and this was, it worked as a very good character building uh, or character reveal for you, but it was a little crazier than what we would normally do in Inkwell. But again, it was all in your head. You failed the wisdom save. Oh, yeah. And then you got like a three on it. You failed the wisdom save, and then you were in the, you were in the bathroom, and the toilet started talking to you. And then the sofa started talking to you. And like this, but these are all things I that cast we... vicious mockery on the couch because they were sassy. Oh, yeah. No. Um, Obviously, it didn't work. Couch. But, but the important thing, oh no, it was, it was. It's emotionally destroyed couch. 
Uh, it was like, I have roses on my upholstery. No, anyway. <laughs> but the important thing was that as, as uh, Dungeon Masters, whether you're at home or on stream, you need to be gauging your players' reactions to things. You need to be constantly polling the room, watching for their tells. And I knew when Satine was over it, because I know her well enough, I've played with her enough, I know when her, her attention for that thing is starting to wane. And likewise, we had another player who wasn't in the scene, who wasn't a part of it, and that player sometimes uh, enjoy, really enjoys the hard-boiled nature of things, but sometimes doesn't enjoy the zanier parts or the, the things that, that uh, he can feel that is uh, non-consequential, right? So, it's, and it's about managing, all, not only when Satine is done with it, but when that player is done with it too, and when the rest of the table is ready to move on, because it has to stay interesting. And then you do that at home, but on stream, I have to be mindful of how much time I'm allotting for that so that yeah. we can continue to move. Yeah, hands down. Yeah, so the prep for that, which Satine, I think all three of us can know, like your, cha your prep for an online stream can change like that <laughs> because somebody can't show up, because there's yeah. traffic on the 101, because whatever. Yeah. So your prep has to be <laughs> yeah. rolling Definitely. in a way. Satine, both Satine and I, in our last couple of games, had to essentially drop out entire acts or more of our our prep and almost roll with whatever the players were going to get. Oh, us. I didn't prep at all last time. There was nothing. I yeah. had nothing. It, it was, was such a fun game, though. Head. It was so good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> and we had to do the Dungeon that. Master thing because, in that particular case, I front loaded all my prep. So yeah. basically, I designed the room and relationships in the city so that you guys could treat the stream like a home ga campaign where you just pick where you want to go. Right. Yeah, sandbox. Yeah. Exactly. And like and the thing is too is like I like I definitely my home games are exponentially different than the stream games mm -hmm. because Ooh, I streaming I mean for me personally, I have a table that I play with that we hand built. Um my friends uh, Avril and Richard helped me design it. And then the whole group of people that I play with on Wednesdays, legitimately, we built a table in one of our rooms. It looks so it's epic. It's a great oh my table. God. <laughs> but when I am at that table, I feel like I'm at a, I'm home. So I have my television and I do projected maps because it's <gasps> much, yeah, because it's, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm a dungeon master who is not good with, their hands. I can't draw. I wish I had that ability. So to, like, I cannot draw. Um, if I practice a bunch, no doubt I could, but my time is finite. So I have to pick and choose what I spend my time on. And I really don't, I'm really not good at like map construction and I don't like spending tons and tons of money and money on already painted minis. So it's like, how do you, for my style at home, my digital maps help cut down that time in half. And I can just play on those and change it off uh, quickly. Show images uh, of the different characters. It's just there's a there's a there's an accessibility that is quick and easy. And because mm -hmm. these people are all my friends, you know, we'll we will let a joke run on for an exponentially right. long time. We will swear a lot more. <laughs> uh, yeah, not gonna lie. That's a big one. Uh, there's a lot more alcohol involved, um, <laughs> yeah. usually, or like there's meals we'll have, or sometimes I'll do like I'll do very experimental stuff with them, things by candlelight. Like we'll put things on candlelight. We'll do dream sequences. We'll do like interesting flashbacks. We'll do um, uh, usually story arcs sometimes built within the worlds of previous uh, games that have been published. Like we we there's a lot more room to play. Mm -hmm. But also because there's so much play, the sacrifice of like deep emotional intent is kind of there for us because it gets it's so lighthearted sometimes right. that I love the fact that stream gives us a place to really dive more into character, which is, which is for me, the dif the biggest difference in games. Which and you I'm would think is different, to, right? You I'm would think trying, at home you get more. Yeah. Well, Cause I tried to, really. I tried to meld those worlds as best as I can. I can, but I do feel like levels of comfortability change because there is no camera on. We actually, on my Wednesday game, started to record, like just oh. for fun. We were like, let's do, let's try to do a podcast or something because we've been playing for years together and you're all amazing. And the moment that the podcast started, it everyone changes. changed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it was, it, it was cool. great, but it was like, oh, listen to the pacing. Listen to the fact less crosstalks happening. Like there's things you sacrifice, like comfortability and and comedy, or um, self editing more. Yeah, people will self edit and, for sure. Yeah, and, and and as a storyteller, I work in either facet, but 
for my live streams, I definitely feel that my prep is a bit more intentional. Um, I actually pretty much run pre-built modules at home because I like to sandbox from pre-established worlds. So mm -hmm. I'll put something in Princes or in Horde or in Tyranny, or I'll take some sort of like small published journey and adventure and then build out from well, there. it kind of trains you though. It, it well, does. That's why I love yeah. modules. And I love to learn the lore. So at home I can like exercise lore and then here I am able to implement everything that I actually play at home that informs this game. Right. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's almost like taking classes on my own with all these amazing people and then coming here and being professional. It's, it's, I you think know that, what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I think that one of the things that we really have to be thoughtful of is the feeling of not closure per se, but of completion of like having yes. some sort of compartmentalized uh, ending to a thing. Whereas in the home games, you can kind of go until you hit that, or you can cut it off and you know people are going to come back. But like sometimes you get that that feeling if you're at a home game and things are moving slowly that you're just not completing anything, that things yeah. aren't the story isn't moving. And to me, I actually I actually really enjoy streaming because to me everybody is on it. Like everybody's thoughtful everybody and they're thinking looks at about each it. other. Everybody's paying people. attention. Nobody's shooting magic missiles into the Cheetos. <laughs> Nobody's, you know, pouring Mountain Dew all over the... Nobody's, yeah. and, and usually, like, we're mindful enough, because we're censoring ourselves, you're not going to have somebody necessarily table flip on you. But that also means that you have to be, you have to be very thoughtful of the aftercare that happens after uh, a session and about the prep, the zero before it. Yeah. Because everybody needs to feel like all that stuff they couldn't say on stream, they can talk to you about. They can be open with... It still needs to feel like that is your, there. everyone is your friend. Yeah. Because you're going through the gauntlet together. Yeah, you want it, like the, the biggest thing is like in either option, like genuineness and like honesty are by far the most important, like that doesn't change. Right. Like the fact that we're all trying to tell a good story together, no matter yeah. what, doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It's just sound levels can really change too. Yeah. The Mountain Dew can, less Mountain Dew on the stream. Yeah, I mean like for number one rule, like good big, big, easy thing for you to do to make your stream a lot better is no eating on stream oh, yeah no gum things like that, that are opposite. super easy that's like the opposite of what i've spent the last 20 years 30 years doing at my table mm -hmm. one of the things i've noticed is how ever when you're playing a game at home it's so casual everyone at the table tracks a story but in their own way in, in their own way, yeah. right? They take what they want out of it. But you put a camera in there, everyone has to be mindful of what story they're projecting. Right. And I think that's the biggest difference is being concise and clear because, you know, at home you're playing a game, but on stream you're telling a story. Right. And you're right. You're not telling the story. We're all telling the exactly. story. And we're involved. And when people talk over each other, you, you can't get the story. When somebody is over here talking and whispering in the camera or the microphone gets it and you're the dungeon master yeah. and you're trying to t give that, they miss out and suddenly the story is chaos when it goes out through that camera and then nobody can follow along at home. Because essentially what we're making is some hybrid between a campaign and television. Right. Yeah, and I, I come from, you know, eight, plus years of improv experience. Mm -hmm. And so actually I think that's probably been the most informative thing that I've ever had yeah. because the seamlessness that you get in on camera gameplay is improv experience. That's two things. That's pacing, mm -hmm. that's self editing. Yep. That's um, it's being mindful not to go for the joke, yeah, but to play the game. But play the game. And like that's the thing is that I think really the reason why home games can feel so astronomically different than a streamed game is because of that element of like it, everyone's improvising, yeah. like everyone's participating. And that's, an, that's a really interesting point because coming from voice acting, which I forgot to mention that we do, like, I'm <laughs> the voice of Dern. Um, like the yeah, and we list. do them in the game, yeah. right. Uh, from the acting that we've done and the voice acting stuff, the reason voice actors make such good players and DMs is because number one, you've got a script. You go through, you know you have to hit these certain lines, but then we get the opportunity to go through and, and meddle with those mm -hmm. and to, to try different feelings and thoughts, which is what actors do when they're doing their normal prep for a scene or even just for an audition. But in voice acting, you get to go through and, and play with that 
with the mindset of a different character and then under, and then go through the character's backstory and start thinking about how are different ways that we can change that. And as a dungeon master, that helps us significantly because we have a script that we've kind of got, right? Like like Satine and like you, like what we're saying is that like um, for, for Inkwell, there's like eight storylines going on. So wherever the players go, we've got something for it. Yeah. It may not be something we've thought about this week, but it is something that we, we have a loose idea of. And so we can improv and pull and draw what we need to in a scene, in a game, in that moment to get the reaction uh, and make sure that it's meaningful. Because yeah. when I'm playing, uh, when I'm dungeon mastering, even if it's at home or on stream, the thing that stays consistent is that I want you to have some sort of emotional connection with what's going on. And that's a storytelling trick. Yeah. Is that a scene should always have an emotional anchor. Yeah. And so I always try to make sure that wherever you guys go, there's an emotional anchor, even if that emotional anchor is the player that's sitting next to the other player. Because Satine's character might feel for your character going through whatever it is you're going through. We were talking earlier off camera about passive uh, versus active, yes. not only role playing, but yeah. passive versus active storytelling. Story yeah. And the way that somebody remains active in a passive environment is by choosing to care about the, either the other people that are there or the situation. And that takes them out of being passive. Mm -hmm. because they are actively listening, actively involved and engaged, and you can see it happening. So how do we relate all of this to um, the differences of streaming versus uh, playing at home? Because, you know, everyone's there at home to just spend their day off with their friends. Right. Like, how do you, do you mm -hmm. bring anything from streaming back into your home play? And how does that affect your players? Or do you just kind of keep them separate? I think there's an active awareness kind of situation going on here because I think that what streaming gives us is it is the refined, almost advanced version of what we do at home. At yeah. home, we can lag. We it's, can roll very, it's very heightened. And it's also like, what? why are you doing this? Like, what's the intention of it? Is it to hang out with friends and be casual? Then don't feel the pressure or the need to make it a stream, you know, or if something you are streaming in order to get people, uh, you know, like workshop actors or get people, you know, into characters and roles that they would never get the chance to play. Like I know that Allie who plays Lilith on Girls Gets Glory loves the fact that she gets to play somebody who's kind of like <laughs> evil and, and it does these like crazy things that like a lot of the time women are not associated with. So, yeah. so, so what is the exercise and the purpose of right. what you're doing? And and I can take that home. I mean, I take anything home. I will take a free coffee home. I will take a free Kit Kat. I will take anything home because I am take notes. Yes, I'm somebody who's about who who thinks they can learn in any area of life and you or, or or um, collaborative in any essence of being collaborative. I feel like I'm learning, whether it be in television writing, whether it be in uh, D and D in improv, mm -hmm. all of these things inform one another. And to not say that my live streaming hasn't affected my home play would be a disservice to that. Yeah. If I said no, then that would not be, True. I would have to look a little bit inside and say, why, why is why am I not learning something or taking something away from streaming? Right. I'm definitely learning about the professionalism, mm -hmm. the, the timing is a big thing. The intent. And, and, and the intent. Yep. And I'm learning pacing. Um, I learned that I used to smile too much. Here's what? So I watch. So here's an interesting thing that streaming taught me. Oh, as a get, as a tell. I, yeah. Yeah. I was rewatching me playing as a dungeon master in the first couple episodes, and I was like, I smile too much. And it, it gives, oh, it doesn't give anything away because you never know if it's, if it's good or bad with me. You never know with the smile. Um, <laughs> But like, I was like, I want to start to learn how to do a better still face. And so these are things I would have never seen in my home game. Oh, there are things that so. when I go back and do my notes on streams, <laughs> yeah. I will crack up on that I was completely straight face forward while we were playing. Yeah. That I was just like, I was stone cold whenever we were doing this thing. But then when I go back and watch it, I'm like, how did I make it through that? <laughs> I know. I think that uh, a good platitude for what you were talking about for the learning thing is that like when we stop learning, we're like sharks in a way. When we stop learning, we start dying. And so like oh, the man. best way for us to continue evolving and again, we're, we're in our comfort zone and we don't want change. Yeah. But the best way is to continually seek out that, that information gain and that change and then apply it. 
intelligence versus wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to apply <laughs> what you can learn through your intelligence. Yeah. So this has been a very fast hour. We have wow. three questions from the audience. Rapid fire. Um, it is 145. Or is it 145? I got 145. I don't know what, time it is. what day yep. is it? <laughs> and it doesn't help that we just like sprung or no, we fell yeah. back. I don't know. I've been up since yeah. like 5 a.m. So I have no idea. I travel too much or not enough. Um, for those of you out there, I say after too much. these questions, aw, thanks, buddy. I miss you too. Hmm. After these questions, we're going to choose a raffle. So, exclamation mark raffle, get in there. Um, but we already have the questions. So, if you want to ask more questions, just hashtag Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, hashtag ask Satine and then ask me in Twitter. First question. We're going to do these, the first two fast. The last one's a long one. Uh, this one is from Jeffrey Kane. Thank you. Uh, what is your feeling on props handouts at your table? Do you prefer them to be DM made or player made? Uh, on stream. I have started incorporating more props on stream. Um, and they're usually made by me. But I love when the characters bring in, I actually have been talking to some of the girls about bringing in little elements of their character because I feel like sometimes when you can visualize it, it just gets you even more immersed into the world. And I'm, I'm, a, and I'm an immersionist. Is that mm -hmm. a thing? Let's coin it. I'm an immersionist. So, um, <laughs> so yes. So that's my answer to that one. To me, uh, we were talking about meta and stuff again. We, you guys don't get to watch it all, sadly. <laughs> but we were having this great conversation about meta versus, uh, and, and also Coda, which we'll tell you later. Um, <laughs> but meta is at the end. Ha ha. Uh, joke. Um, nobody got. <laughs> great joke. Right? Yes, right. Uh, so <laughs> with, with the meta thing, it's like, yeah, immersion is important. And, uh, but also, especially if you're on stream, making sure that it is something that actually fits the setting and fits what's going on. And so that means that you have to be on the same page as your player or uh, if the player is going to be bringing something in, they need to, to know that that's, like if they come up with some prop that's it's weird for where you are at, uh, then then you kind of like throw, it's going to be a big question mark for people. So. I, I, I try to incorporate weird props, but Sirens is weird. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then so it's situational. then it becomes yeah. it is situational, but then it also becomes an exercise in improv. Like, okay, so then how does this work? How yeah. do you do? It? And you have to almost blue sky it right there yeah. before the game, yeah. so that you're not caught off guard with it. Then. Speaking of caught off guard, last night at the Extra Life game, Chris Lindsay's game was awesome. He yeah, I watched it. Played uh, he dungeon mastered a game by Lisa Chen and Will Doyle, which mm -hmm. was hilarious yeah. and super gross. But there were these awesome, awesome puzzles, and there was like all these handouts, and I'm like. Well, at home, I would be like, okay, let's do this. Let's go into these puzzles. And But, you know, having done so many streams now, I'm like, wow, this is a beautiful puzzle. Not doing it on stream. Yeah, and I would I, have to craft it. And then we it. gave it to the Kenku, who wasn't talking anyway, which was great. So it was really interesting. The kinds of props that you use at home are not always the kinds that are good for stream. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I did appreciate those puzzles because it was... A puzzle introduced, it was like a newspaper introduced, and then another piece of paper of advertisements introduced, and then this other thing that led wow. back to all of those. Right. And it was this beautiful weave of um, uh, clue relationships. Yep. Cool. So that is really interesting. Okay, question two. As a DM, how strictly do you enforce rules on the stream? Let's start with Rudy. <laughs> uh, so it... To me, it's situationally dependent. Um, and being the dungeon master, you get to uh, kind of decide in the moment how you're going to play that. But to me, the communication, what all rules are is the baseline for communication. So what that means is that it needs to be consistent. Because if you start letting one player ignore the rule, then you're kind of playing a favoritism, or at least that's how it's going to be seen. If you're playing and you change the rule constantly, well, then your players don't have the touchstone of, well, what does this mean to my character then? I, I could do this or I, I don't know. Plus, they also don't know how to explain it to you in order to get what they want out of it yeah. or to even get close. So to me, I'm more of a tell me what you're trying to do. And then let me see which rules are actually the ones that need to be implied, as that's opposed the, to... That's my favorite style. It's the best way, because you don't want a player to go, well, I'm doing this and this and this and this, but you as the dungeon master need to be knowledgeable to know, oh, okay, but for this situation, that the rule you're trying to put into effect isn't actually the rule that we would use. Yeah. And so and I don't like it when players tell me which rules they're going to do unless I ask for the clarification Or of if it. they roll ahead of time. I can't stand that, because it's like, oh, you don't know what... I mean, by, by the way... 
that role doesn't count. I'm glad you got a crit and everything like that, but you also just robbed the audience from getting to experience that with you because yeah. you did it ahead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just weird if you're in the middle of another I, thing and somebody goes... Yeah, I definitely think that rules create stakes because if you didn't have rules, then it would just be a bunch of people without any stakes doing anything they want, and that's just like a messy improv session. <laughs> um, I, I think that rules... Uh, they're the thing that make it worthwhile. Yep. It's without them, there's no game. And I'm not somebody who, who hinges on rules by any means. Like right. I, I will not stick to certain rules. I like to break certain ones. I like house. I have certain house rules that I like to have, but I do think that when you play within the world of something by paying respect to what that's been created and what that's given you, it gives people it gives certain people who, who, who need that opportunity to explore things and areas of their, of themselves and their characters they never would have had Mm -hmm. without rules, a very dominant character or player could take personality could, could totally take over. But by, by being able to have rules, it then becomes a game. It becomes a shared experience and collaborative storytelling. You really can't do D and D with one person and the DM, you know, it's about, six or seven people yeah. the rules provide that opportunity so i like rules as long as they help advance the story as long as they're informative character choices right and i often at times will break the rules for stronger storytelling point like points yeah. like so I, the two things that I'm i would not gonna say lie. <laughs> yeah, the two things that i would say really quickly to, to kind of like put that into a thing is that rules are important because they give new players the baseline for the thing. If they're not veteran players, they might not know how to bend things certain ways or how to reskin something. So it, it actually makes the people who would be more timid uh, more open to to jumping in and to diving in because they can, oh, this is what that means. Okay, I got that. But the thing that I do for every single game, whether it is at home, whether it's at a convention or whether it's live stream, is our Session Zero uh, has somewhere in there my favorite quote that I live by, that is, a world with no consequence is a world of no consequence. And you can say that the same way with games and with yeah, rules. If so. it doesn't matter, then why are we doing it? Yeah. Um, thank you, Limited Seahorses, for that question. Good question. Uh, I really enjoy having the rules, but having, having my players push them and then bending it, but yep. not like kind of bending it, like really bending it. <laughs> um, but one of the things uh, to go back to streaming versus not streaming games, I have noticed we have a lot of new players on the streams. Uh, one of the yeah. things that we have been doing, if we forget rules or whatever, and this is something that you know I think I did last week or the week before, where okay, you can't actually confront your player at the table when you're streaming. You know, it's like okay, well that wasn't really a thing. Um, so writing notes after the fact, having a review is really good. But when you're gaming at the table at home, you're like, okay, well, let's take some time. Yeah, you have 15 minutes to look something up yeah, and talk about it. Yeah, you just can't take it. the time anymore um, on stream. Well, you can't take the time on stream because it doesn't make for good television, right? So um, one of the things that we've been doing to kind of bypass that every once in a while, um, actually Sin. I think we've only been doing this with Sin. Sin and Kenley. Um been playing with them off camera yeah and we play such a casual game like either it'll be a half hour or it'll be two hours and it's them exploring their characters and actually like training them so that when they go on stream they know it a little bit better Mm -hmm. okay last question we only have a couple minutes um and i want to wrap this up with your house rules so that's going to be next hold on this question is by uh, Only Play Wizards. <laughs> Question. <laughs> oh, that's Dev. Is it? No, wait. No, that's a different tag for a okay. different thing. So <laughs> one of the worries about streaming games is that it is... Exp- oh, this is why... I- this is the question of why I wanted to do this in the first place. Okay. Good job. Um, <laughs> it has exposed a lot of players to D&D. However, I've encountered new players that expect home games to be like stream games mm-hmm. in terms of game style and production. How do you balance that and taper expectations? That's it. There's expectations. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that I think that in a world, in a world built on self-satisfaction and expectation, that can be the antithesis of some of the best creative exploration. So telling people right away, like, I know you might have expectations, but 
this is, let me explain to you what I am doing mm -hmm. this for. And just communicate. Like, I'm doing this to create new friends, to be social. I'm doing this because I really enjoy battles and I love running through battle mm -hmm. sessions. I am doing this because I want something to do in my free time. I want a new activity to take on. Like, if you're just honest about that, then I think then it becomes more fun for everybody involved because when, and it, whenever somebody might place expectation on somebody, that's where the, that's where things will falter. Cause nobody can meet anyone's expectations uh, unless you, I mean, I actually believe that f fervently. Like, well, you can't meet them if you don't know what they are. And if you don't know what they are, especially if you've never played with them before. Right. So it's about journeying through that and like finding common ground. It's about working on that together. And if people are coming in and they're, disappointed because it's not crisp and refined and there's not La Croix in the fridge and La Croix. La Croix is where I'm going to go for it. Then, then I think that they rather they need to reevaluate what they want to get out of the game or they might need to take some time away and process all of that because, because like I started playing D and D just because I loved the game and I started DMing simply because I wanted to try to learn. Like I was a rough DM and certain people did play with me and were like, Ooh, I don't know if this is the game style for me. And I'm like, you know what? That's fine. And communicating that with me, I won't take it off. I will not be offended by it. Mm -hmm. um, it's something just that, about that. Yeah, something that Satine and I, I think that is a little bit different about the way that we've kind of come up as opposed to like CR is that CR has their, their they play with those people for a long time. They know each other very well. But Matt, and Matt plays every now and then with like, uh, you know, uh, force gray or like with other people uh, grabbing in there and he has his style but everybody knows it because they've watched enough what Satine and I have kind of had to uh, champion uh, is the idea of when we bring new people in sometimes they don't know how to play with the other people that are there sometimes they're they play a different style of, of RPG there's like you're saying there's always that need to facilitate what the expectations are supposed to be and we put a lot of effort into championing, championing, -ing 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 -ing, <laughs> session zero. Yeah. And that is a session, session zero, zero at the beginning of your campaign. Yeah. And then have a check-in about probably every three to four sessions. But also, I do session zero every single game. Five minutes at the beginning of a game, whether I've played with those players or not. I remind them about what the world's like, about what they're doing, and... I take the time to go and find out what they want out of the game, exactly. what they expect out of the thing, because that way we can blend what our expectations are together. And if they start to move back and forth, we, we can work with that together. Like the same thing with having, uh, with everybody knowing that this is a game of consent. Yeah. That's you have very to be ready for somebody to go, Hey, I'm not comfortable with what's going on and say, yes. Okay. Let's put a button on that. Or let's come back to that. Or let's just, you know, cut that off of the, the root. And that shouldn't just be on you as a DM. That is on every single person at the table because it is a shared cooperative experience where you are all storytellers. So players out there, communicate with your dungeon masters what you want and set expectations so that they understand. Dungeon masters, if you have groups that you like on stream, talk to the dungeon master. Find out what's important to them because we all learn from each other. And that's the point of this entire show. Lauren Urban is going to draw the raffle or has already. Uh, real quick, what is your what are your house rules? I only have the ones that I can only think of off the top of my head are a couple. Um, the power of positivity. I do not round down for anything. I round up. Everything like damage, everything like that, all rounded up. So I when something's tapped, I like to think of, like it better for the villains and better for also the players. And then the only other thing is I do Banff invisibility spell. Um, I usually like give people advantage as well as the plus tens and things like that. There's certain spells that I like to tweak for flavor text because I think they should be more powerful. Hmm. Um, so those are the two house rules off the top of my head that I can think of. Um, otherwise, like everyone be kind and be courteous and also always speak as your character if you can. <laughs> yep. Uh, I would say that one of mine is active role playing and that's not like they're, that's not to pull somebody out of their comfort zone necessarily, but it's to help with preventing metagaming. Because if you're, yeah. if everybody knows that what they're saying is to be taken in character, then that means that when somebody says something, you don't have to go, are you saying that in character, out of the character? You just have the world react to it. Because it should be obvious when a player is addressing you as a dungeon master, um, creating that whole, Satine's very good about going, um, dungeon master? 
so that we know that what she's saying is completely out of character. They teach yeah. you that in school. Raise they your do. Hand. But that <laughs> whole, but, I mean, like, but the things that we get, that entire escapade with the drinking thing that happened in Inkwell was because you said something meta that we didn't let roll meta. We ran with it. And that created an incredible game. That created an incredible moment that people loved like, and made clips and clips and clips about. So for me, my home rules are be considerate to everyone else that's at the table. Make sure that if you're doing something that makes another player, as a player, uncomfortable or the DM uncomfortable, that you are mindful of that and you are ready to draw, like pull back and be thoughtful. And then you must stay afterwards. You must stay for a minimum of 15 minutes because we all need to hug it out. We need to talk about the crap that happened. And if anybody, like, if somebody leaves and they're upset, you're letting somebody drive upset. You're letting somebody go out into the world with a bad situation that they got from this game that was supposed to be fun and supposed to be taking care of people. Yeah, or you just need to hug because it was so fun. Was yeah, fun. don't miss yeah. those moments to like to gush about your yeah. game. So thank you guys for being on our show. This is like the first not official official episode of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Start with the round table. Thank you for having us. Yeah. A uh, big congratulations to Glue Crow, who just won a Dungeon Master's Guide. Oh, Brand spanking new. Not even used. Um, real quick, I'm going to, over the next uh, episodes, I will give you little tidbits of my own um, house rules. And one of them is... Don't tell other players what they need to do. Don't metagame, right? Um, let the person make their own uh, choices and let them fail because fail is fun for story. Fail for story, yeah. everyone. Roll for story. We're going to wrap up. Thank you guys for spending your Sunday with us. But don't go away because in an hour, Girls Guess Glory is going to be back with this one and her friends. So thank you all for watching this. Uh, don't forget to send your one-minute videos of your house rules to dndfanart at wizards.com. Have a lovely afternoon.